our six-part series leading up to Christmas, which is already next Sunday, entitled See, I Told You, as we are walking through the six Old Testament prophecies that Matthew includes at the outset of his gospel that surround the birth of Jesus Christ and reveal how Jesus is the Messiah that God had promised to send into this world for hundreds and thousands of years beforehand. This series started by seeing God's promise in Isaiah chapter 40 to send forth a messenger ahead of the Messiah that would prepare the way for him by being that voice that would cry out in the wilderness for the people to repent of their sin and to turn to God in faith. And Matthew showed us in chapter 3 how John the Baptist is that messenger. We then saw Micah proclaim to the southern kingdom that when the Messiah came, he would be born in that little town called Bethlehem. And we saw God in his providence lead Mary and Joseph down to Bethlehem by using that decree of Caesar Augustus that required that every Jewish person had to return to their hometown to register for the census. And since both Mary and Joseph had lineages that traced back to King David and therefore to Bethlehem, they found themselves in that little town when the time came for Mary to give birth to her son, the one the angels told her to call Jesus, for he would save his people from their sin. Last week, we saw how God, through the protecting love of his son, led Jesus down to Egypt, along with his earthly parents, Mary and Joseph, in order to escape the war that King Herod was going to wage against this child that he saw as a threat to his kingdom and to his reign. And in doing so, Matthew shows us how God called forth his son out of Egypt, just like he called the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. But while that son was called out of Egypt because they stood in need of redemption and salvation. This son, the true son of God, was called forth out of Egypt in order to provide the salvation and the redemption that the world stood in need of. And now today we move into the fourth of the six prophecies in Matthew's gospel as we see the effects of the war that King Herod is waging against this child, against this true son of God. And so now as we listen to the voice of God from the word of God for what scripture says, God says. Wherever you're at this morning, if you're able, I want to invite you to rise with me. As we stand in attention to the voice of our God from his word, Jeremiah 31, we're going to read verses 10 to 17. Then we'll turn to Matthew 2 and those words will be on the screen for you. Here's verse 10. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Proclaim it in distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. For the Lord will ransom Jacob and redeem them from the hand of those stronger than they. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord, the grain, the new wine, and the oil, the young of the flocks and herds. They will be like a well-watered garden, and they will sorrow no more. Then maidens will dance and be glad, young men and old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness. I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. I will satisfy the priests with abundance, and my people will be filled with my bounty, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping Mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because her children are no more. This is what the Lord says. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears for your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. So there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. Matthew 2, starting in verse 16. When Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious. And he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity, who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. A voice is heard in Ramah, weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And this is God's holy and inerrant word for us today. Let's pray together. 
Father, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. By your commands is your servant warned, and in keeping your commands there is great reward. So help our hearts to see, hear, understand, and apply your word to our lives this day that we might truly live. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake, and together we say, Amen. Please be seated. Have you ever started watching a movie that you thought was one thing and it turned out to be something quite different? I remember when I was in college and Lisa wanted to watch this movie called A Walk to Remember with Mandy Moore. And we were dating at the time and so I was happy to watch any movie with this beautiful young lady I was falling in love with. But I made the assumption, based on other movies we had watched, that this was going to be a romantic comedy. Well, it was indeed romantic, but as we started to get into the movie and Mandy Moore's character revealed to the boy she was falling in love with and who was falling in love with her that she had a terminal illness and was going to die, I quickly learned there was nothing comedic about this movie. I thought I was in for a lighthearted love story, and by the time this movie ended, my stomach hurt so deeply, I can still remember the pain, and I swore I'd never watch that movie again, and I have not. In a sense, that's kind of how the second chapter of Matthew's gospel is developing. After Jesus' birth to Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem, we get insight into an amazing event. As these magi from the east... Non-Jewish pagan stargazers, astrologers, make their way to Jerusalem, appear before King Herod, and announce that the king of the Jews has been born somewhere in this area, and that they know this because a star has led them to this place. And so King Herod summons the Jewish chief priests and the officials to inquire of them where this Messiah was going to be born. And what the chief priests and Jewish scribes revealed, as we saw a couple weeks ago, is that while they knew what their Bible said, they simply did not believe or live out what their Bible said. They knew, because everyone knew, that the prophet Micah had foretold that when the Messiah came, he'd be born in that little town called Bethlehem, about five miles south of the capital city of Jerusalem. So King Herod sends these magi down to Bethlehem to search for this child and tells them to come back and report to him the exact location of Jesus so that he too can go and worship him. This amazing story continues to build as they find the place that the star had stopped and they enter the house and they find that child with his mother Mary and they fall to their knees and they worship him. They present to him these very expensive gifts that they had brought with them. Everything about this story, it seems so great and amazing until the angel of the Lord starts showing up and handing out warnings. The angel first shows up to the Magi and tells them not to return to King Herod, and so they don't. And the angel then appears to Joseph in a dream and tells him to head down to Egypt with his family, for Herod was going to search for this child in order to destroy him. For King Herod saw the one the Magi declared to be the king of the Jews, a great threat to his kingdom and to his rule. But God, in his providence, proved himself to be sovereign, all-knowing, and all-powerful by handing out these warnings as our passage today begins with King Herod's furious rampage. When Herod finds out that he's been tricked by these magi, that they are not coming back to announce the location of Jesus, his fury begins to rise within him as he announces to the army, this child must die. And so in a tragic turn of event, King Herod sends his military officials on a five-mile death march down to Bethlehem to kill every male child two years and younger, which was the oldest possible age Jesus could have been based on when those magi appeared to the king. And Matthew declares that this horrendous act of King Herod is repeating another devastating act that had happened in Israel's history about 600 years beforehand. 
But in the midst of that devastating act, God had spoken words of promise that following the devastation, there would come salvation, rejoicing, and redemption. And Matthew intends for us to see that now following this devastating act in Bethlehem, Jesus is fulfilling those words of promise by bringing that salvation, that redemption, and that rejoicing into the world. And so what we want to see in our text this morning is that by Jesus coming into this world on Christmas, he turns our weeping and lamenting into salvation and rejoicing. And we're going to develop that this morning by seeing first the meaning of Jeremiah's prophecy. Second, we'll see the war against God's anointed one. And then third, we'll see Jesus's means of accomplishing that victory. And so first, let's see the meaning of Jeremiah's prophecy. In the midst of describing this horrendous act, committed by a power-hungry, deeply insecure, and scared king of the Roman Empire, Matthew declares that the killing of these children, possibly a dozen or so, as Bethlehem was a very small town with a very small population, that this event is fulfilling what Jeremiah had said in Jeremiah 31, 15. Here's Matthew 2, 18. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted because they are no more. Now, as we said last week, anytime a New Testament author quotes from an Old Testament passage, they intend for us to not only understand the passage they are quoting, but also the context of what was happening when those particular words were written. To to quote a verse is to intend that we understand the paragraph and the chapter and ultimately the book from which that single verse came. And so by writing the words of Jeremiah 31, 15, a verse of deep sorrow and lament, Matthew intends for us to understand at a very minimum the entirety of Jeremiah 13 and how those words fit into the whole. Now in this Advent series, you're getting a brief and very abbreviated explanation of the Old Testament prophets who spoke and ministered either to the northern or southern kingdoms of Israel once that kingdom became a divided kingdom in the year 931 BC. We've seen Isaiah and Micah who ministered to the southern kingdom. Last week we saw Hosea who ministered to the northern kingdom. And again, most of what those Old Testament prophets did was they took God's law, which God had given to Moses in Exodus 20 on Mount Sinai, what we call the Mosaic Covenant, and they apply it to the lives of God's people, revealing how they were sinning and rebelling against God and then calling them to repentance and faith. And oftentimes the prophets would warn the spiritual leaders of the covenant curses and the judgment of God that would fall on them if they did not repent, which is ultimately what led to the northern and the southern kingdom's exiles into foreign nations. And so by the time Jeremiah shows up on the scene, as he is doing his ministry, the northern kingdom has already experienced God's judgment. They've already been sent into exile into Assyria. And by the time we get to Jeremiah 31, he has already warned the southern kingdom that judgment was certainly going to fall because of their continual rebellion against God's covenant. And that exile into Babylon for 70 years was coming. And so chapter 31 is actually looking forward to a time when God's people would find themselves in exile But the whole chapter is actually speaking God's words of comfort and hope. These are God's words of promise that he would at some point end their suffering at the hands of the Babylonians and restore his people to himself again. The title of Jeremiah 31 in my ESV Bible is this, the Lord will turn mourning to joy. That's the message of chapter 31, how God brings rejoicing out of suffering. And verse 15, which is the one Matthew quotes that comes right in the middle of this chapter, it's truly the only negative verse in the whole chapter, but it's a big one. 
as, Ma- as Jeremiah is describing this impending exile for the southern kingdom as Rachel weeping for her children. We talked a lot about Rachel last year when we were walking through the book of Genesis. Rachel was the second wife of Jacob, the mother of two of the 12 sons of Israel, both Joseph and Benjamin. And so while Rachel has actually long since died by the time Jeremiah is writing these words, Joseph's people were up in the northern kingdom and had already experienced tremendous suffering and death and exile. And Benjamin's people were part of the southern kingdom that were about to experience tremendous suffering and death in exile. And so Jeremiah is picturing the great suffering of this entire nation by portraying Rachel from her grave located somewhere near the city of Ramah, which is actually where the southern kingdom people were gathered before exiling into Babylon. Rachel is pictured weeping and lamenting from her grave bitterly at seeing all of her offspring taken off into tremendous suffering and death. This is the picture that Jeremiah is painting in verse 15 of what is coming for God's people. But even as he paints this tragic and horrific suffering, the rest of the chapter, what we've already read before verse 15 and what we're going to see in a moment that comes after verse 15 is God calling his people to not lose hope, to remember their God, to repent of their sin, to walk in his ways, to remember their first love. And when we get to verse 17, we read these words, there is hope for your future, declares the Lord. And your children shall come back to their own country. You see, human sin and rebellion against the holiness of God and against God's covenant has massive ramifications. There's no doubt about that. But our merciful God declares that in the midst of our lament and weeping, there is hope. For the king is coming to restore his kingdom and his people to himself again. That's the message of Jeremiah 31 that Matthew quotes from here. That in the midst of tremendous suffering and and weeping that we will experience in this life and in this world, there is hope. But that hope lies in God coming and redeeming his people from the effects of our sin. And so second this morning, let's see the war that gets waged against God's anointed one. Now, our attention within this passage in Matthew is usually upon the suffering of the families whose children were killed by this blood-thirsty, power-hungry king, and rightfully so. But we ought to continually remember that the suffering incurred by these families was because of the hatred and disdain for the one who had been born king of the Jews. It was Herod's desire for this child's blood that swept up these innocent baby boys into an unjust and horrific death. And yet, this should not surprise us at all, that when the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus as God's anointed one enters the scene as the second person of the Trinity takes on human flesh and blood, that the powers of this world would wage a war against him and against the Messiah. That is the picture given to us at the outset of the book of Psalms, when in Psalm 2, we read these words, why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. See, those whose knee never bow in worship to Jesus Christ as King of kings and Lord of lords will not just be indifferent to him, but will despise and reject him, will seek to burst his authority and rage against his lordship in order to elevate ourselves to the place of glory and honor in our lives that rightfully belongs to God alone. The human struggle is a struggle of lordship. And we will either submit and surrender ourselves over to Jesus as our Lord, 
or we will set ourselves against him in order to be the king and Lord of our own lives. And this spiritual struggle goes back way further than Psalm 2. For in Genesis 3, when Adam and Eve sinned against God in the garden, God declared these words to Satan in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring, Satan, and hers. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. See, ever since humanity's fallen to sin in the garden, there have been two lines of people. Two lineages of people, those who are of the seed of the woman, those who are of the offspring of Eve, people of faith who trust in the offspring that was to come forth from her line and defeat Satan and sin, and those who would reject that offspring and prove themselves to be of the seed of the serpent. And between those lines, until Jesus comes again at the end of this age, there will be enmity. And a desire to crush and defeat the one that God has promised will overcome Satan and sin. And so King Herod, he's just joining in with those who throughout the generations have hated God and his kingdom, would much prefer to be the Lord and King over their own lives rather than living for the glory of our creator. But what these passages in Genesis 3 and Psalm 2 and Matthew 2 and Revelation 12 that we don't have time to look at this morning, but I encourage you to go home and read it later today. What all of these passages reveal is that this cosmic battle between God and his enemies has real ramifications for humanity and specifically for the people of God who align themselves with the seed of the woman, with the one born in Bethlehem. And this is clearly seen in the suffering and death of those innocent baby boys in Bethlehem, simply because they were born in the same place that that anointed one, that Messiah, was born. Friends, we need to know that when we align ourselves with the one born in Bethlehem, suffering, persecution, weeping, lamenting is sure to come our way. It was part of our king's experience, and it will certainly be part of ours as well. You may experience ridicule. You may experience the loss of friendships. It may cost you a promotion or a pay increase, and we may reach a point in our lives where living in obedience to our king means living in disobedience to the kings over our land. And that may cost us freedom, wealth, and influence. In the great Hall of Faith chapter, Hebrews chapter 11, after it gets done describing the great acts of faith, and the experiences of those who lived by faith, that great chapter ends with these somber words. Verse 36. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were killed with the sword. See, far from believing in a health, wealth, and prosperity gospel where if you just believe in Jesus, he's going to make your life luxurious and comfortable, we need to see that this cosmic battle between God and his enemies will make it so that even as we hear the amazing news of Christmas, that Jesus came into this world to bring salvation and redemption, with that news comes the reality that suffering at the hands of God's enemies is likely to be part of God's people's story. And therefore, like Rachel from her grave, we weep, we lament, we cry out for the hope and healing that God alone can offer to us and that God has now come to offer to us. And so finally this morning, let's see how Jesus turns our sorrows into joy and accomplishes his victory. There are certain chapters and verses in the Bible that need to be cataloged in our hearts and minds, and Jeremiah 31 is one of those chapters, which Matthew quotes from today. 
I mentioned that this chapter, Jeremiah 31, reveals that in the midst of tremendous suffering, experienced because of human sin, there is yet hope for God's deliverance of his people. And we see that hope spelled out specifically when we get down to verse 31 of chapter 31, as God declares these words. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. A new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. You see, in the Old Testament, God spoke about this new covenant that he was going to establish with his people whereby our sin would be forgiven, removed, and remembered no more. This new covenant was the hope of God's people as they would go off into exile and experience suffering and death because of their rebellion against God's covenant. And Jeremiah reveals that in verse 31 that this new covenant was going to come after the weeping and lamentation of verse 15 had occurred. And so by Matthew quoting from this chapter and applying verse 15 to the weeping and lamentation that is now happening in Bethlehem, He is showing us that this new covenant that God promised to establish with his people after the weeping and lamentation had occurred was now here and would be established through the one who was born in Bethlehem. The tears that have flowed from the eyes of God's people because of our separation from God due to our sin would soon end because the Son of God has now come to restore us to himself so that God would be our God and we would be his people. And therefore, when this child had grown into a man, And this sinless man sat around a table with his disciples to enjoy his last supper with them before submitting himself to arrest and trial and flogging and ultimately crucifixion upon a cross. Jesus creates a new meal for his people, for his church that we call the Lord's Supper or Communion. As he takes bread, he blesses it, he breaks it, he gives it to his disciples to eat, and he says, this represents my body, which I am about to give up for you. And then he took a pitcher that had within it the wine of grapes, and he pours that wine into a cup, and he proclaims these words from Luke 22. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. You see, as Jesus' blood was poured out on that cross, the new covenant that God had promised to establish after much weeping and lamentation had occurred was now here. And it would be through Jesus' own weeping and lamenting upon that cross that our sin would be forgiven and remembered no more. The kings of this earth, they set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed one, just as King Herod did when that anointed one was born. But in the greatest act of irony the world has ever seen, it would be through that anointed one's own death, on his own terms, of course, that Jesus would accomplish the victory he was sent into this world to win and the new covenant would be established with the people of God. Jesus declares in John 10, 17, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. Friends, the reality of the sufferings that we will experience in this life will cause us to weep and lament just as they did our Savior. 
And those are perfectly appropriate responses for the people of God. But in the Christmas event, as God took on human flesh and blood, he has made it so that now we weep and we lament with hope. For our God has provided a way for our salvation and our rejoicing to happen again. Only the God of the universe, the God of the scriptures, our God could cause rejoicing and, and dancing to come forth out of weeping and lamenting and sorrow. And so this Christmas, he invites you to come to him to turn to him, to trust in him, for he has, is, and will continue to heal all parts of this world and our lives. And he is coming again to make all things new. When he does, friends, make sure you are ready for that day. Let's pray together. Father, you are not unfamiliar with that which causes our hearts to weep and lament. We do not have a God who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have a God who came for us so that in the midst of our weeping and lament, we can have hope. Hope because your son through his blood enables our sin to be forgiven and remembered no more. And therefore, you are our God. And when we trust in Jesus, we are your people. All praise, glory, and honor to you. We pray this in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. Amen. Let's respond rejoicing in our King and what he's done for us. Would you please stand?